I am Kim Snyder, and thank you so, so much for joining me for the SANE Crypto Podcast, the first cryptocurrency podcast for baby boomers investing for retirement. Most people believe crypto assets are too risky for the average investor. I believe the risk is in not investing, and that in fact, cryptocurrency may be the answer to near retirees' prayers. But the trick is to structure our investment so that if the naysayers are right, we don't do irreparable harm to our nest egg. But if the believers are right, we make potentially life-changing money that could catapult us across that retirement finish line. The Sane Crypto Mastermind is my signature program for those who want cryptocurrency type returns, but can't, won't, or, or don't have time to figure this all out and keep up with it on their own. If you'd like to learn more, I'd encourage you to join my free online training called How a Little Little Bit of Bitcoin Can Make Your Retirement Savings Go a Lot, Lot Further at sanecrypto.com forward slash retirement. Which leads me right into today's topic. What if? What if? One of my new Sane Crypto Mastermind members, Mike, sent me this email. Quote, Kim, I had a question that came up with one of my highly skeptical friends. His thesis, Bitcoin is the first cryptocurrency. And once the big players get involved, i.e. Bank of America, Chase, etc., and they make their own cryptocurrencies, people will buy those because they are name brands with trust and the government and the money to elite behind them. In his view, and his friends who supposedly work at Ethereum, Bitcoin and Ethereum will be the Friendster or MySpace or uh, to Amazon, Amazon coin or Chase coin or Facebook coin. I was a little compelled by this thought because if we we're in the first wave of the cryptocurrency era, why wouldn't Bitcoin suffer the fate of a first wave.com company like pets.com? What makes Bitcoin different that it can survive as more trusted, quote, cryptos pop up? This is a really important question, and I am so glad you asked it, Mike. Um, first of all, you should know that I both agree and disagree with pieces of your friend's thesis. Uh, in fact, I make a very similar argument in explaining why I don't invest in the altcoins. You can find that um, in its entirety on, either on my blog at sanecrypto.com forward slash blog, or uh, also it's also episode number 16 of the podcast, which was titled, What is an ICO and Why Don't You Invest in Them? But on the other hand... <laughs> The argument smacks of familiarity bias. It is the same argument we've seen made and made to look foolish thousands of times. To wit, ask any of the venture capitalists who scoffed at Airbnb, for example, when they had the chance to invest back in 2008, when the company was raising a $150,000 seed round at a $1.5 million valuation. Many, many recount that their thought process at the time was something to the effect of, are you kidding me? Who would sleep in someone's house over a brand name hotel like a Holiday Inn or Marriott? Ick. And yet, today... Airbnb has over 5 million listings worldwide, including nearly 3,000 castles and 1,400 tree houses. And on any given night, something like 3 million people are staying in other people's homes around the world on Airbnb. According to an article, they are now larger than the top five hotel brands combined. And that original $150,000 investment Eh, today it's worth $25 billion. But the truth is, right, it actually, it really doesn't matter 
what I think or your friends think or even what Warren Buffett or Satoshi Nakamoto or Vitalik Buterin think. Because here's the thing. No one knows. No one And that's a key concept you have to wrap your brain around to become a successful investor. The moment you hear yourself saying the words, I think that should be a big red flag that immediately pulls you up short. Everything is just a guess or supposition colored by our cognitive biases. Now, yes, some are better guesses than others, some more informed or less biased than others, but until Silicon Valley invents a crystal ball, it is all just a guess. Moreover, I would argue that people are really, really bad at predicting the outcome, even when their guesses prove correct. And I have many, many examples from my investing career, um, but one always sticks out. I think it was, um, it was probably, let me think, it's probably like late 2002. Um, and my investment method had m- many of our clients in one of the few dot-com stocks that were <laughs> left standing at the time. Um, And not because we thought it was going to go up or that it would become, you know, one of the iconic winners of the early generation of dot-com startups. Um, We were in it because it was volatile. And the Snyder Method uses volatility to generate cash flow, which is the objective of that method of investing. So every time the price would take a big hit as it Um, back at that time was doing very often, you know, my phone would ring and a few of my investors would call to say, you know, I really think we should sell this stock because, you know, after all, it was trying to disrupt a well-known retail brand. Uh, And, you know, gosh, Kim, how on earth are they going to compete? This is, you know, this is crazy. We're going to lose all of our money. And I would remind them, as I am reminding you, that we have no idea what will happen. Just stick to the process. That's why we have a process, right? But now the stock is down like, you know, I don't even remember. It was a lot, 50, 60, 70%, something like that from its all-time high. And Walmart announces that they are getting in the game. And then my phone really starts ringing. Kim, did you see the news? Walmart's opening a competing service. They're going to get clobbered. We have to sell. And as I always do, I said, you know, trust the system. We have no idea what will happen. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself that I'm going to tell you that that stock was Amazon. Uh, But it's not. Close. (laughs) It was a little startup called Netflix. And the behemoth that they were going up against originally was Blockbuster. Of course, now everybody knows how that story ends. Netflix took over Walmart's competing online DVD business in May of 2005, and Blockbuster, having long since become a shell of its former self, declared bankruptcy in 2010. What's the moral of the story? We think we know, but of course we don't. Now, could Netflix have lost to Walmart or Blockbuster? Totally, totally, right? That's the point. The point is, in the moment, we can't know. And right right now, we're in the moment. So what we have to do is to design our investment processes around that lack of knowing. Our job is to accommodate a range of possible outcomes such that we don't get killed when they go against us, but we do really well when they go our way. Which leads me back to cryptocurrency. You know, this is really a, um, this is a venture capital investment, basically, 
dressed up as a publicly traded asset. So what you are being offered is basically the chance to make an early stage startup investment with commensurate levels of potential upside and potential risk. Now you've probably heard if you're a, a, if this is not your first time listening to the podcast, you've probably heard me talk about Pascal's wager until you're ready to throw up if I mention it again. Okay, fair enough. The technical term for Pascal's wager is optionality. Nassim Taleb describes optionality in his book, Anti-Fragile, as, quote, the property of asymmetric upside, preferably unlimited, with correspondingly limited downside, preferably tiny, unquote. Trent Griffin of the highly recommended blog, 25IQ, says, venture capital, when practiced properly by a top-tier firm, is a classic example of a business that benefits from optionality. All you can lose financially in venture capital is what you invest. And your upside can be more than a thousand X of what you invested. Taleb says, if you have optionality, you don't have much need for what is commonly called intelligence, knowledge, insight, skills, and these complicated things that take place in our brain cells. For you don't have to be right that often. All you need is the wisdom to not do unintelligent things to hurt yourself, some acts of omission, and recognize favorable outcomes when they occur. And then finally, Trent Griffin again, quote, it's not always possible, but when positive optionality does appear, Jumping on that train is a very good idea. Fantastic opportunities don't present themselves to a human being every day, but when they do, it is important to take advantage of them. Being patient and yet aggressive when an attractive opportunity presents itself is a great way to prosper and be happy in life. Low downside and a big upside, you do it big downside and a small upside, you don't do it. Big downside and big upside, you ask yourself whether you're playing with house money that you really don't need and how passionate you are about what's involved. Small upside and small downside, meh. So in investing is a probability game. Nothing more, nothing less. When you understand that, you understand the keys to being a great investor. Cullen Roach of Orcam Asset Management puts it this way. The smartest investors know that they're actually not that smart. (laughs) That is, they recognize the fact that they're going to be wrong a lot. But in realizing this, they also acknowledge a more important fact that they don't have to be right all the time to succeed. They just have to be right about the right stuff when it matters, end quote. So how do you play a probability game like investing? And specifically, how do you play the probability game related to cryptocurrency? Well, I would say three things. One know the game you're playing. That is half the battle because most people, and I mean this in the nicest way, Mike, like your friends don't. (laughs) Um, But most people really don't, most people do not understand this. Okay. If you get that, then you have an edge over all those people. Number two, creating and sticking with an investment process or system to improve the chances of us not doing something stupid that messes up the probabilities. And then three, invest a small amount in this case. In trading, that's called position sizing. Any trader will tell you it's critical in managing risk and investing, we call it allocation. Either way, right? Critical, critical, critical aspect of managing risk, even though it seems so simple. 
And so I believe, as you have probably heard me say, that at this stage, cryptocurrency should be 2% or less of your total investable assets, okay? Because of the optionality, we're making, we make a small bet on a big outcome. If it hits, that is great, right? We're in the money, but if not, no harm done. And, and then, you, you know, the what ifs, I mean, you, you just, you can't think about those because you just don't know. And if you do think about them, they'll make you crazy and they'll make you do the wrong thing. All right. As always, I hope you found that helpful. If so, you could do me a great big, big, big favor in return, which is one, to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode, and two, leave me a five-star rating and review with comments and feedback because there is an algorithm in iTunes, as with all things, and the more engagement that you have with the show, the more comments and ratings and subscribes that I get, the more people iTunes will show it to you so more people like you can find it. Um, if you're listening on Apple's podcast app on your iPhone, just tap the show's cover art. Most people don't know this. Just tap the cover art and then scroll way, way down and you'll see a link below the first review that says write a review. You can do it right there. You don't even have to have a computer. Um, and I'd be so appreciative. If you'd like to learn more about investing in crypto assets for retirement and my system for doing that, I recommend my, <sighs> easy for me to say, I recommend my free online training, which is how a little, little bit of Bitcoin can make your retirement savings go a lot, lot further. You can find that and register uh, at sanecrypto.com forward slash retirement. And then finally, you can get the full show notes of this episode at sanecrypto.com forward slash podcast, including lots and lots of links this week to additional resources that dive deeper into both investing as a probability game, as well as optionality. So again, the on, uh, free online training is at sanecrypto.com forward slash retirement, and the show notes are at sanecrypto.com forward slash podcast. And finally, if you have a question about today's topic, anything I said, you want to debate it with me, you have a question about anything else related to investing in personal finance, just email me at askkim at sanecrypto.com, just like Mike did. I read and answer every email personally, as well as answer some of them here on the show. Everything I say on this show is for educational purposes only. Nothing should be considered investment advice. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All investments involve risks, so do not, under any circumstances, invest money you can't afford to lose. That's it for me. I'm Kim Snyder, and I'll be back next week. Until then... May the crypto gods continue to smile on us all.